Coming up on today's show, we're going to look at K.J. Hamler's restructured contract and talk about what it means for Hamler and for the team and what you have to know. Plus, we're going to look at a breakout candidate from a Broncos publication, and we'll see who they selected. And then we have a new segment at the end of the show, so if you have not stuck around for it, I suggest you do so. It's a fun way to kind of bridge the gap between mini camp and training camp. But let's start with the K.J. Hamler news because the Broncos and Hamler agreed to tweak the last year of Hamler's rookie contract. Now, they are not moving any of the base salary, which sometimes you see teams do. They convert some of the base salary into a signing bonus, which gives the player more guaranteed money, and it lowers the cap hit for the team. That is not the case here. Instead, what the team did was they added a little under $500,000 in incentives, and they also added an injury-specific IR split. So what does this mean in English? Basically, the team gets some extra protection in case Hamler goes on IR, and they don't have a lot of money being spent on someone IR, which last year was unfortunately the case for this for this team and uh, KJ Hamler has an opportunity to earn some more money right some extra incentives dollars hanging in front of him and he gets some roster security as well because if there was a gun to my head I would not say KJ Hamler is a lock to make this roster but after this move I feel like the team does find a roster spot for him Hamler so far in his three-year career unfortunately the story has been his lack of availability, just 23 games through three seasons, three touchdowns, 620 yards. The lion's share of that production coming in his rookie season, and then the ACL injury, the hip injury, last year the soft tissue injury, and then this offseason, a partially torn pec while working out. K.J. Hamler has missed a lot of time, and it's been one of the biggest bummers for this team because he came out of Penn State with an incredible straight speed, 40-yard dash that was supposed to stretch the field. Never really got that. And fast forward to 2023, and Denver has to use another day two draft pick on a player who is more or less a younger version of K.J. Hamler, right, in Marvin Mims, because they didn't get that out of K.J. Hamler. So now they give Mims an opportunity to stretch the field and be that vertical threat and something they don't really have with Cortland Sutton or Tim Patrick. And Judy's definitely got some wheels on his legs, but he's not quite as fast as Marvin Mims. So the Mims draft pick really spoke, out, uh, spoke to me and jumped out to me as a, we're kind of raising the white flag on K.J. Hamler being this team's vertical threat. Now, I do believe K.J. Hamler will make this 53-man roster, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, they are, of course, all locks, along with Marvin Mims. I think Marquez Calloway is going to make the roster as well. He was signed during free agency this year. He played in New Orleans with Sean Payton. He found a role on special teams. That is definitely an area that needs to be improved. So I believe Denver is going to hold on to Callaway. Hamler, I think, gets the sixth and final wide receiver spot. I don't think Denver takes seven wide receivers. So that puts Jalen Virgil, Kendall Hinton, and Brandon Johnson on the outside looking in. All players who were at one point on the active 53-man roster last season. And then the odd man out is Lil Jordan Humphrey. I really just wanted to include this because his name is Lil Jordan. Like, it's an all-time name. If Lil Jordan Humphrey could find a way to make a play for this team, that's going to be one heck of a highlight. Now, speaking of K.J. Hamler... 381 yards is what I'm going to set the benchmark at for an over or under. The reason why I picked that number is that is his single season career high. He got to 381 yards in his rookie season. So do you guys think he can beat that number or go underneath that number? While you're typing O for over or U for under, make sure to subscribe, by the way. And if you have not subscribed and you want to get a shout out because we are in the business of giving shout outs here on the Broncos Breakdown. Type me. I know who you are if you've already subscribed. YouTube sends me a lot of information. But if you're new to the channel and you want to get on screen, type me, hit that sub button, and we'll give you a shout out on a future show. Now let's switch gears here and talk about Greg Dulcich, the man with the flow, because the Broncos wire from USA Today listed Dulcich as its breakout candidate for 2023. This is the offseason of everyone's in the best shape of life, and then overweight, 
Diet Coke drinking media people like me are giving out breakout candidates for 2023 over and over again. The former third round pick out of UCLA ended up finishing third in receiving yards for this team last season, which is kind of good, right? It shows he had a good rookie season, but also a little bit sad because you don't want your third place receiving yard finisher to only play 10 games. Like, You'd like to see some other guys put up some bigger numbers playing more football. But Dulcich last year, he missed the first five weeks of the season, had that big coming out party against the Chargers on Monday Night Football. 411 yards, two touchdowns from 35 receptions. Now, if you take those numbers and you were to stretch them out over the course of a 17-game season, had he played a full season based on that you know, trajectory, Nearly a 700-yard tight end, three touchdown, 56 grabs. So there is reason to believe if Dulcich plays a full season and he improves from last year, that 700-yard mark could turn into 800, 850 yards, and three touchdowns could turn maybe into five touchdowns. That would be some good production right there from a third-round pick in his second season. Now, before we get on to the rest of the Dulcich segment on today's show, the 4th of July is just around the corner, and it really is this time. So it's not too late to get a Broncos USA 4th of July themed t-shirt. Do not go into your wardrobe on Tuesday. Do not open your closet and pull out an old, old Navy USA themed t-shirt. No, get a brand new one, brand spanking new Broncos 4th of July themed shirt. You got to get it today. Otherwise, it will not arrive by the 4th. So use our link chatsports.com slash Broncos USA. It's in the comments and the description. Click on it, get the shirt, and do your future self a favor come Tuesday. Now, personally, I'm expecting Greg Dulcich to have a strong second year. I don't know if I'm fully in bed with him being a breakout candidate in 2023. Not because Dulcich is a bad player or because I think he's not going to be a good player. It's the number of targets he's going to get, right? Will he have an opportunity to get a lot of looks and then put up some big numbers? If you go back to a season ago, the air attack for Denver in 2022, they finished 16th in pass attempts between Russell Wilson and a few Brett Rippin throws here and there with, a fi with 571. So this is my concern. They were middle of the pack last year, right down the middle in terms of pass attempts. If you want a wide receiver to have a breakout season, it's not a complete correlation, right? But you would like to see more pass attempts because that just means more targets for that receiver. And I don't think that's going to be the case in 2023. I think Denver's going to fall back from 16, somewhere closer to 22 to 20. Because when you look at what Russell Wilson did when he was a Seattle Seahawk, I mean... He never finished higher than 16th in pass attempts, right? Seattle always had him towards the bottom of the NFL. And when Sean Payton talked about turning around this team, he said, we're going to go back and look and see what Russell Wilson's hits were, right? We're going to find his best songs, his best hits, best hits, and then we're going to play that on repeat. Well, if he looks back to his best times in Seattle, it involved running the football a lot. Now, he had some great wide receivers in Seattle still, right? Doug Baldwin put up good numbers for him. Uh, Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf. So this isn't saying that you can't have good receivers or have good production in an offense that finishes 28th or 19th in pass attempts. I just don't know if you're going to have enough of the football to go around when you already have a wide receiver room with Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, and Marvin Mims, who are going to command their fair share of targets. So now I wonder, where is Greg Dulcich going to fit in, right? If this was a pass-happy offense, I'd be a much bigger believer in a Dulcich breakout season coming. But I just worry about Denver just simply not throwing the football enough to get Judy, Sutton, Patrick, also Mims, and Dulcich a good amount of targets to warrant Dulcich having a breakout season. That is my hurdle, right? If I'm told before the season starts, Denver's going to end up throwing the football enough to finish top 10 in pass attempts, yeah, sign me up for the Greg Dulcich hype train. But if I'm told the Broncos take a step back in terms of attempts and they finish closer to 
20, 21, 22. Well, then I start thinking, well, Judy's going to get his fair share of looks. Then there's Sutton on the pecking order. Can't forget about Patrick. Oh, I wonder, is the fourth highest targeted player on the offense due for a breakout season? I don't know, Jim. Now, when you look at the leading tight ends from last year, just want to throw this up as sort of a reference here to say Evan Ingram kind of blossomed out of nowhere, right? No one saw that coming, at least not coming out of New York. So it does happen, and I'm not doubting Dulcich's abilities or skill level. I think he's a very talented football player that he's going to make some great plays. I just don't know if Dulcich is just not going to get enough looks to put up big enough numbers to have a check breakout season done. Now, who is your breakout candidate? I will give you mine in just a moment, but I want to hear from everyone watching who your breakout candidate is. For me, this is really easy. I'm going to go with Jerry Judy. And I was thinking about this. If Jerry Judy, who had 972 yards last year, had one more reception for 28 yards, and he was a 1,000-yard receiver for the first time in his three-year NFL career, I feel like the narrative around Judy so far in Denver would be drastically different, right? But because he didn't get 29 more yards or 28 more yards, he's not a 1,000-yard receiver. And we look at him through a whole different lens of former first-round pick, year three, still not a 1,000 yards. I mean, yeah, not, not he's not, but he was right there. So I think Judy is going to get over that 1,000-yard mark and everyone will pay, finally, people that take him in rounds three or four of your fantasy football draft will pay off for getting Jerry Judy. Now, the new segment we have rolled out here on the show over the last week or so have been my summer hot takes to kind of get us through the dog days of the offseason. So it goes purely based on the high in Denver, which today is 69 degrees, so it did not even meet our chart for summer hot takes. So I'm giving this a cold pizza take. I don't like cold pizza. I never understood why anyone preferred to eat cold pizza over reheated pizza. I don't microwave pizza. I just put it back in the oven for like two to three minutes. But my cold pizza take, the Broncos are not going to be outright embarrassing in primetime games last year where we are scratching our eyeballs with forks and knives, begging this team to get flexed out of primetime. I don't think it's going to be a complete 180, and they look at this primetime schedule here and go 4-0, and but I think they could go 2-2, two and two, right? At Kansas City on Thursday Night Football, that's going to be brutal. I mean, it's never, it's never easy playing Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs now. Uh, week 10 at the Bills on Monday night, I kind of think the Bills are going to regress this year. That's kind of one of my hot takes. I just wonder, a lot of other teams in the AFC took a big step forward this offseason. Buffalo stay the same, and if you stay the same, you move back in the NFL. Uh, week 11, they got to beat the Vikings at home. You can't lose to Kirk Cousins in primetime. Cannot happen. Cannot happen. And then week 16, in my book, primetime games are any standalone games, so even like the London games, I kind of count as a primetime because everyone's watching you. All eyeballs are on you. Uh, they play the Patriots at home on Christmas Eve, so I think they could easily find two wins right there, right? Whether it's I think the Patriots kind of the, the, the Patriots are going to suck a little bit, so it could be the last two, right? Kind of go chalk here, lose to the Chiefs, lose to the Bills, beat the Vikings, beat the Pats, or they could shock Buffalo on the road coming off a bye, and then win the next week at home against the Vikings on Sunday Night Football. So I think Denver. It's not a blazing hot take. It's only 69 degrees, nice at the Mile High City today. So I'm going to go with Denver. It's just better than they were last year in prime time, which honestly is not saying a lot. But that's why it's a cold pizza take. All right, what is your record prediction for Denver in prime time before I let you guys on out of here and enjoy the chaos of NBA free agency? Four games in my book. What do you have going? I'm going to go two and two. Give me your record prediction down below.